Ecclesiastes chapter 11. We'll look at verses 1 through 6. Cast your bread on the surface of the waters, for you will find it after many days. Divide your portion to seven or even to eight, for you do not know what misfortune may occur on the earth. If the clouds are full, they pour out rain upon the earth. And whether a tree falls toward the south or toward the north, wherever the tree falls, there it lies. He who watches the wind will not sow, and he who looks at the clouds will not reap. Just as you do not know the path of the wind and how bones are formed in the womb of the pregnant woman, so you do not know the activity of God who makes all things. Sow your seed in the morning and do not be idle in the evening. For you do not know whether morning or evening sowing will succeed or whether both of them alike will be good. You know, as we study scripture together, Bible studies, Sunday school time, um, on your own, during sermon time, as, we, as we're in the Word of God, we have you know, a chance to read it and study the Word of God, we recognize that God's Word is given to us to help um, direct us in our lives. It's to bring direction for us. Uh, we don't study just for study's sake, just to say, well, I've studied the Bible, but we study so that we can learn the truth of the Word and, and build that foundation of, of truth in our lives. And then we, as we do that and interpret Scripture, then we're able to bring some application to our life. What is, what is the Word saying to me, you know, to help me in my day-to-day -day life? Now, we're not, by doing that, we don't have to come up with some kind of new and uh, crazy interpretation to get it to fit our life. We, we understand what's written and we you know, understand that truth and then see how God applies that for each one of us. And that's what God does through his Holy Spirit in our lives. We know that Ecclesiastes was written as a wisdom literature, just like the book of Proverbs, just written in a different way. Um, not as straightforward as you get with the book of Proverbs. We've talked about it the wording of it, the phrases, you know, what, what Solomon talks about. Uh, it's strange for us, that type of literature. Now, it's a type of literature that was more common in that day, in Solomon's day, but for us, it's a very uncommon way of, of writing. So we just kind of have to look through that and try to understand the literature. And then once we understand that, then it starts making sense on how we can, you know, understand the truth of it and then build that truth, um, build the application from that truth. Now Solomon's wrapping this book up. As he's coming to the end of this, um, he's, he's not, he's not going to talk quite so philosophical there towards the end as he has been along the way. Um, it seems like he's kind of getting to a little more straightforward, practical stuff for us and then to finish it up. Um, with, with a major theme that has actually been throughout the entire book. And so we see that as we come to the end. Basically, what we have here in these verses here in chapter 11, Solomon's talking about having a faith in God and that faith should be lived out in our lives. And, you know, remember, that's, the, that's what Solomon talks about in Ecclesiastes. Are you going to live your life under the sun, which means you're just living your life day to day without God's involvement in your life, or do you live a life that follows God? Now, as he obviously throughout this is recommending and, and pushing towards this idea, we need to live this life following God. And as we do, then we're gonna, we need to live this life of faith. And he starts telling us a little bit of what it looks like here in the book of Ecclesiastes. It shows us that, uh, you know, when we have faith, that it will... Um, it's going to change the way we treat one another. It's going to, through our faith, people should be able to see that, that we follow God in our lives. And so we just need to examine our life and ask, can people see by my life, by my responses to things, my, to people, to situations um, in my life, do, do I show that I have a faith in God, that I put God first and I trust in him? Now, James is a little bit more straightforward in the New Testament. James just says stuff like, well, faith without works is dead. I mean, it's just clear, straight out there. Um, if you say you have faith, uh, then it needs to show up in your life. Because if it doesn't show up in your life, James says, well, I'm going to challenge the idea that you actually have faith. And he's, he's not afraid to say that. Uh, what, and so what we, we need to recognize in our lives is that when we have faith in God, 
We have to make sure that that faith in God goes beyond Sunday morning in church, but it's something that affects us every day of our life and is seen every day of our life as we are interacting with, with others in life. So that's what we need to think about today as we look at Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Asking ourselves that question, God, is, is my faith showing? Do people, do people see my faith in you um, when I, you know, the way I live, the way I respond, the, the decisions that I make, the things that I'm involved with? Do people see that? That's what we have to look at. And so let's see what Solomon talks about here um, in this chapter. First of all, he says, our faith will result in generosity. That's one, of the, that's one of the messages here in Ecclesiastes 11, that our faith will result in generosity. Verse 1, cast your bread on the surface of the waters, for you will find it after many days. This is an interesting verse. Probably of all these verses here in Ecclesiastes 11, this might be one that you've heard um, before. Now, to cast your bread, to throw your bread on the water, is he's not saying, take your bread, throw it out on the water, and feed the ducks or something with it. He's not talking about that. But, he, but actually, to cast your bread on the water is to send it over the water. And the picture is that you take your grain or, and you load it up in a ship and you send that somewhere else to bring benefit to somebody else. Now, you may get a result of that. You, you know, something may good something good may happen as a result of that, but that would just be a total surprise for you. That's not why you're doing it. You're just, you are trying to help others and, um, and you may find that unexpectedly um, in many days. Solomon is telling us that in our life, we need to be involved with generosity. Our generosity should be a part of our life, helping others, being kind to others, showing, showing kindness, um, showing love in our lives to others. That should be part of our life. That is sending it out on, on a daily basis. So verse 1 basically says, practice generosity without a thought of getting anything in return. No strings attached. I'm just going to be generous. I'm going to follow the example of God, and I'm going to help others. We see that here in Ecclesiastes. It's in the book of Proverbs as well, this idea of generosity. If you get something in return, well, that's just a welcome surprise, but that's not the reason that you're doing that. Verse 2, right after that, talks about not knowing the future, not knowing what misfortunes might occur in the future, and don't let that stop you from being generous. Uh, you know, make plans, make good plans in life, but, but um, don't let that unknown future hold back your generosity. Uh, you, know, you know, we're going to make our plans, uh, but, you know, we can't tell God, well, I'm just, I'm going to put this generosity stuff on hold until I'm able to kind of get my life in, in order the way I want to get it in order. Be careful with that because God wants us to live this life of generosity because that's, that's who he is. He's a generous and gracious God. So don't let the unknown future keep you from showing that generosity that God wants you to um, to do um, to show now, Solomon's not talking about you know lack of planning, um, you know lack of preparation in life. Just you know just to just throw everything away. He's you know godly counsel's important, making good decisions, all that's important. But we have to be careful of, of the excuses in life. See, those excuses will keep us from doing what we're supposed to do, and so that's the message that that comes uh, from Solomon. So the question is, are you a generous person? We know that God is a generous God. Do you show his character in your life? See, when you live a life of faith, you are, you are in your faith, you are taking on the character of God, and you should be showing that character of God in, in your lives. Now, it's interesting, but as I was looking at these verses, it reminded me of something that this world has marketed and advertise in the Christian community and outside of the Christian community. You've probably heard of random acts of kindness. Well, random acts of kindness, just randomly, for no reason given, just doing something kind for somebody, it's, it's become a very big deal in the Christian community, but also outside of the Christian um, community. People, there are many people who have grasped a hold of this idea and they're living this as part of their lives that they want to show in their life, you know, random acts of kindness. 
there's actually a random, of acts, uh, random acts of kindness foundation. Their theme is inspiring a culture of kindness in schools, homes, and communities. And I feel a little bit bad because we missed the Random Acts of Kindness week, which was February 9th through 15th. There's actually a week for that. I guess they have days and weeks for everything, it seems like, these days. But on their website, they said during that week, they were encouraging their people to step it up, take that week to step out of their normal routine or comfort zone and attempt a new random act of kindness every day of the week. And, you know, as we, as we look at that, you know, this, is, this is just within the world. The world's doing this. This, isn't, this random acts of kindness group is not from the church. The idea is from the Bible. You know, and as we look at Ecclesiastes, we recognize there's nothing new under the sun. We recognize that, that, um, that when, when we read about people doing good things or these new ideas of how to treat people better, that really somehow it's coming from Scripture, whether they realize it or not. Um, and then they, but they'll come up with it and market it as their idea. But, but we find um, this idea of this, these societies, random acts of kindness, foundations, this is all from God. God is, um, uh, this is how God tells us to live. And the one thing I think of that we need to look at when the world does this, it should help the world recognize there is a God. There is a God. Where did this come from? Where did this idea show up of, of showing kindness? We didn't evolve into this. Where did it come from? It came from within because that's how God created us. He created us to be like him. Ecclesiastes, we said, talks about that. And he created us to be like him. And so whether a person is in Christ or outside of Christ, he's been created by God. There's something in his character that should be drawing him to, be, to, to learn more about God and, and to show the character of God. That's what we work on every day of our lives. So these kinds of groups should show us, yes, we've been created by God, and this is a, just a natural response to it. it you know, they're kind of doing it on their own. We do it because of faith, and, and that's what... That's what Solomon's saying here. He says, in your faith, as your faith grows, this should be the natural result. He's not just saying, oh, go out and try to do these things. But he says, grow in your faith in God. And as you grow in your faith in God, then these will be the natural results of that. That's the, the way that we should look at that. Um, and also, let me just make a, a side note um, with this as well, that when we talk about being generous and I talk about being kind and loving and, and all of this, we need to be very careful that we don't use this as a way to en enable others to do the wrong thing. You know, sometimes we want to keep showing kindness to, to people and they keep making bad choices and, and then we continue to show generosity and kindness, think calling it generosity and kindness, but it might be enabling. We've, you've heard about that. And, and we don't want to encourage somebody to make bad choices because in Christ, we're to speak the truth in love, right? And so we have to make sure we admonish and encourage and, and strengthen and not just keep bailing a person out through what we would call kindness. But we do need to show kindness. Kindness needs to come from us. It needs to come from the church. The world needs to see that from the church that we, that we do this. Another one of these movements is called the Pay It Forward movement. You're very familiar with that. It started in the Bible, by the way, started in the Bible. Um, then later on, somebody wrote a book calling it Pay It Forward. They made a movie about it. And basically, you know the idea that you do some act of kindness to somebody, but you don't want them to repay you which comes out of Ecclesiastes 11.1. 1. You don't want them to repay you. You want them to go and show that to somebody else, you know, paying it forward. And there's, you know, there's all sorts of ideas. There's all sorts of websites. There's all, so, all sorts of support groups that, that work with pay it forward. But again, this comes from God. This hasn't been made up. It, it comes from God because that's how God has created us. This is something within us that should be pushing through that flesh and so that, you know, that we live for God. And, and as, people, as people want to be helpful, these are some of the things that they have come up with. Again, it, to me, it shows, it shows the existence of God um, because why in the world would we do something like this? 
Why would we logically just start helping people and not want anything in return? That's a generous spirit that God has given to us. But folks, we have to make sure that that when we think of generosity and kindness and helping people, that we're not just thinking about these groups. The church should exemplify that. We need to lead the way in that. And a lot of times as a church, we're known for being judgmental and bashing people on the head and telling people how bad they are and wrong, how wrong they are. But the church is not seen as the group that's loving people and showing, the, showing kindness and showing God's generosity. And so we have to make sure we balance those things. But it's done because of a relationship with God. It's done because of our faith in God. Those are the things that should naturally, naturally result from that. True faith results in generosity. And we need to make sure that we show that in our lives. Others can see that. Secondly, as we talk about living a life of faith, our faith is needed because we don't know the future, right? We, we need faith because we don't know the future. Verse 4 is for our farmers. It says, He who watches the wind will not sow, and he who looks at the clouds will not reap. Solomon uses weather to show us the unpredictable nature of life, right? We cannot control the weather. We might try to predict it. We, you know, we, we look at our, we watch the weather. We look at weather on our phone to make sure what, if what we're going to do. And we might believe the forecast. We might not believe the forecast, but we can't control any of it. I mean, think about it. What, how would you like the weather controlled by committee? That would be, be miserable. Um, so, and just like we cannot control the weather, we cannot control the events in our lives. You know, we know what we can do. We can control our decisions, but we can't control the decisions of people around us. And yes, you try to make a good choice, and hopefully... Because of that good choice, there are going to be good circumstances that happen. I mean, that's why we do all of that. But we can't control that. You might make a good choice, and then all of a sudden people around you make bad choices, and that affects you adversely, even though you're trying to do the right thing. So the, the proverb here in Ecclesiastes shows us the farmer who's overly cautious. He wants to plant, he wants to reap, but he wants to do it at the perfect time. And the picture here is he becomes paralyzed to do nothing because there's no perfect time. And so you do it in the best time that you have because the weather is not perfect. Um, we have to, we recognize that. I was just, I was thinking about this a little bit yesterday. Yesterday was the, the riding of the Jalapeno 100. And some people rode 100 miles and 60 miles and 50 miles and 25 miles. How many were out there riding their bicycles in the Jalapeno 100 yesterday? Raise your hand. I know some of you are out there. Good. Good job out there. And so as you were out there riding, well, when I was riding, I, was, I came to this one stop. We decided to go ahead and stop and get something to eat and drink. And as I was standing, you know, so windy yesterday, right? Just so windy. And, and I was watching the weather, and ahead of time, I go, oh, my, it's going to be so windy. And last Saturday was so nice, and the Saturday before that was so nice. And, but it seems like when the Jalapeno 100 comes, that weekend is the, is the cold weekend or the blustery weekend. And so we were finishing up, getting close to the end, and I'd stopped at this one place to get something to eat, and... Uh, this guy came walking by and somebody was complaining about the wind and he says, well, you can't, you can't control the wind. I go, that's from Ecclesiastes. And it's right. Ecclesiastes tells us that we cannot control the wind. And so we can't control the elements. We can't control things that go on in life around us. We can't control that. We do the best we can making the decisions that we can make. Uh, but, and so life is like that. You have to choose. You have to move forward. You have to make decisions. You need to make good decisions, but you just don't know what's ahead. Don't let it paralyze you. That's what Solomon is telling us. Don't let the unknown future paralyze you from doing the right thing. Um, verse 5 kind of lets us know that we don't even know exactly how God works at times, and that's true. We, we walk by faith in some of these areas. Verse 6 tells us don't be idle. Um, he says instead of, instead of being idle, we need to step out in faith and be productive. So in your life, live a life that honors God. Step out in faith 
Do the right thing. Step out in faith. Be productive in this life. Now, obviously, think things through. Get godly counsel. Do the right thing. But you just don't know the future. So don't let the unknown future keep you from living your life for God. Keeping you from living a life of faith. Our, God, our faith in God is needed because we don't know the future. I mean, you think about life, as I've talked about it already. You make decisions. You have the, you have the picture of those results when you make those decisions of how you expect it to result. But there's all these other influences and things don't always turn out the way that we want them to turn out. But when we walk in faith in God, we recognize he's still involved in our lives. He's still with us. He hasn't left us. He hasn't quit working in our lives. So he's still working in our lives. And when the dust settles, then all of a sudden we can look back and say, yeah, God was at work. It didn't turn out exactly the way I wanted. Maybe the journey was a lot harder than, than what I wanted. Uh, but now I can look back and say that, that maybe my character has been changed. I've been made stronger through this. Um, God's worked on something in my life. And when it's, when it's all over with, because it's hard to see it in the journey, but when it's all over with, we can sometimes look back and say, yes, God was at work. And now that's not an excuse to do dumb things and bad things and expect God to you know, bail you out or do some, do some miraculous thing for you. No, the life of faith that's not going to be paralyzed by the unknown future is to, do, to live the godly life. But even when the results aren't what you expect, you can still see God at work. That's what, we want to, that's what we want to see in our lives as God would strengthen us, as our faith in God would grow um, th through this. And so as we look at those lines, there's one more thought that Solomon shares in these verses that I want to share with you. Number three, our faith should eliminate anxiety. We've talked about this before. We probably need to talk about it a lot um, because, you know, we don't know the future. Um, so we have to ask, do we... Do we know, are we going to allow that future to cause us, the unknown future to cause us to be anxious? Well, I'll tell you one thing. Without God, you should be anxious. You know, without God, you should worry because, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. But as we have our faith in God, we don't need to be afraid or anxious um, about the future. Um, our faith in God should eliminate that anxiety in life. We're told in Scripture to pray and not to worry. You know, I know we kind of mix that up sometimes. We'd rather worry and maybe not pray, but, but we're told to bring it before the Lord and not worry about it. Now, Solomon's approach in this whole book has been to basically say death is coming. Remember, there's not, a, there's not a picture of eternity in the book of Ecclesiastes. It's just a picture of life. You're born, you live, you die. Okay, that's, that's the whole picture that we find in the book of uh, Ecclesiastes. And he says, uh, he says so you're going to die someday, so you might as well enjoy this life that you're in. That's, that's the message that Solomon keeps bringing to us. In verse 8, he says, If a man should live many years, let him rejoice in them all, and let him remember the days of darkness, for they will be many. He's talking about death. And he says, But when you live the life that you live, enjoy each one of those days. Rejoice in those days. And we have to think about this. Does God... Does God want me to enjoy this life? Does he want me to, does he want you to enjoy this life? I think sometimes we get this picture of God that he's created us in this life to be miserable. And so as we're miserable throughout this whole life, then when we talk about heaven, all of a sudden it sounds a whole lot better than what we're in right now. But our relationship with God is, is going on right now. And we have to make sure that we understand enjoying life, not what the world says about enjoying life, but what, about what God says about enjoying life. But let me, let me say this, you know, that in life we recognize there's, there's sin, and that sin messes up a lot of that enjoyment of life, maybe by our own sin or somebody else's. There's sickness because we're in, a, we're in this... Um, this world that's not perfect anymore, and so there's sickness, and there's events that go on in our life. There are things in life that can make you miserable and anxious, but we don't have to allow those things to cause us to be miserable and anxious. They could be places in our life where we 
where we will say, I'm going to trust you, Lord, in the midst of this. Um, Solomon says, take this life, live it for God, and have joy. That's what he tells us to have um, in this life. Live this life for God. Remember, not under the sun, away from God, but live this life for God, and then you will have joy. You know, there's a couple phrases we're familiar with in the Bible. The joy of the Lord is my strength, right? So that joy strengthens me as I live this life. So it's important to have that joy in life. Or, as Paul would say in the New Testament, be joyful Always. So we are encouraged, we're strengthened, we're admonished in Scripture that, that rejoicing and being, having a joyful attitude is how you enjoy life, by the way, is very important in our lives. So what we need to do is make those decisions that honor God. And generally, generally, you're going to see good results from that. That's what the, the wisdom literature tells us. But, but we need to make sure that when we live this life of faith... We live it in faith and not worry. Give it to God. You know, what, what does worry do for us, really? I mean, we think about it. Um, whether you worry about a problem or don't worry about a problem doesn't change whether you're going to have the problem. doesn't get rid of the problem. Uh, I think a lot of times we think that that gives me control. I can just, if I worry about it, I'm in complete control because it's, it's all on me. And, uh, but... You know, we need to release that idea of control and say, Lord, I'm going to make the right decisions. I'm going to, I'm going to live a life of faith in you. I'm going to do the right thing. But I, I can't worry about it because worrying doesn't change it one way or the other. I need to just live this life of faith. Um, and then whatever does happen, we know that God's going to be involved in our life along the way. So live a life of faith. It should, it should affect our lives every day, not just coming together for church, but every day of our life should change as a result of living this life of faith. People should see that. They should see that, that you aren't anxious. They could see that you don't worry. They can see that you respond in the right way, that you're calm when everybody else is going berserk around you. They can see it in your kindness and generosity. They can see in your attitude and your character that there's something different because it's what God is doing in our lives. Allow God to do that. As we live that life of faith, that will draw people to understand who God is, to get a better picture of who God is so that they can put their faith in God as well. Let's pray. Father, thank you for um, uh, your word. Thank you for this opportunity to um, continue to study. Help us, Father, to, to take these words um, that Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes and apply them to our lives in a way that, that will bring honor to you, glory to you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.